Hi, my name is Ed. Uh, I am a creative coder. I'm going to tell you the story of my path to touch designer and audio reactivity. So I studied computer science at Kazan University, but I always had a great interest in, in drawing as well. I didn't know back then that I could combine those things together in creative coding. Last century, people chose a profession for their whole life. Now we can search for what we truly like. I've been a robotics engineer, a content manager, a gesture recognition developer. I had a lot of places of work. I was good at them, but I wanted to improve. I've been a volleyball referee, a texture artist for a railway simulator. Subconsciously, I believe that I needed to love what I'm doing to become great. So I changed my path. I've been a motion designer, a mobile game developer, an interactive designer. You can say that trying new things is my passion. Also, I've been a school teacher and a head of IT department. I believe that every experience shapes who we are in one way or another. And then the COVID happened, which was followed by the lockdown in the spring of 2020. You know, the pandemic situation was a stressful time. One morning I found myself spending eight hours in video games during the night. It was at this moment that I knew I had to change something. Luckily, a few days later, I found a YouTube video about dopamine detox. They told that instead of adding things that are good for you, invert that. First of all, you should remove the things that don't let you use time wisely. So I quit gaming for 14 days, which gave me a lot of spare energy. I decided to upgrade my own character, myself in real life, and started her reading and journaling every day. After a month, I felt a need for creativity. By coincidence, my friend asked me if I would like to create an interactive performance. It had to be a real-time dance visualization with Kinect. I did some research and decided to try Touch Designer. I accepted the challenge uh, to implement the project in one month and started with YouTube tutorials by Matthew Reagan and Albers. I was impressed by how fast and easy it was to make something from scratch in Touch Designer in comparison with P5 coding. After some sleepless nights, I managed to make a good enough visualization in time. I fell in love with this software. It combines coding, real-time rendering, easy prototyping and friendly community. Then I read a book, Still Like an Artist, that changed my life. You can flip through this book in 30 minutes and be inspired by it for weeks. I highly recommend it for anyone who is interested in making art. It provides a helpful reminder that inspiration is everywhere. One of the secrets that I got from this book is to do good work and share it with people. So I decided to take on the challenge of daily posts on Instagram. Every day is a small project in touch design. Progress is pain and reflection. But I didn't want too much pain, so I chose to post every three days instead. I had a full-time job, so I did my creative coding at night. Did you know that it takes 23 minutes to focus on the original task after any interruption? That's why I like to practice deep thinking while everyone is asleep. Motivation is a great start, but it's not enough. Motivation is fragile. It must be followed by discipline with deadlines. And then after some time, it becomes a habit. It worked. I bet you've heard about compound interest. Try to become 1% better every day, and you are 37 times better in a year. If you're doing most things wrong, if you, even if you're really slow, but you just keep going for a long period of time, then you will get to where you want to get to. In the beginning, 
Most people think that they need to get things right, to do things well. No, you just need to get going and then you'll get good. Don't be afraid of making mistakes, fail and reflect. Here is one of my favorite quotes. An expert is a person who has made all the mistakes that can be made in a very narrow field. So at first I watched all the YouTube tutorials at that moment and I tried to recreate them and posted my results. I copied them, aiming for an exact replica, but I didn't get satisfaction. Then I've taken little bits and pieces from many different sources and altered and combined them in new ways. So I've now created something new and original. I've created art, which is any creative work of a human being by definition. So. All the tutorials are done, I still have a challenge of making new things every three days. Limitations in time drive my creative process. Usually I am inspired by someone else's work, or a movie, or some design idea on Pinterest. Then I know exactly what to do and start creating. Most of the time, interesting unpredictable results come while I combine different approaches and tweak parameters in all projects. Sometimes I am really stuck. Then I put my phone away, turn off the light and calm down for meditation. As it turned out, it get, I get something interesting within 30 minutes. You just need to get bored so hard that your brain has no other option but to be creative. Music is a crucial part for audio reactive real-time artist. I use relative free no copyright music, because otherwise my posts are not visible in some regions. I spend quite a lot of time searching for a good fit on the Inverto element stocks. If you're curious, uh, the music choice depends on particular effects, because some visualizations look better when the notes are stretched like an opera. Sometimes edgy sounds are preferred. Also, I do collabs with my friends, musicians. Today's speaker, Dennis Ham, is a good example. So it's been more than two years since I started my Instagram challenge. Uh, these are the benefits. It helps with overcoming imposter syndrome, that is doubting your abilities. It obviously helps with marketing and promoting oneself. Also, my account is a demonstrative database of effects to choose from. It's much easier to show an example to a client. Also, it is convenient to find a project file by the name that I provide each post. A year later, I quit my full-time job. I became a freelance creative coder. Am I rich and famous? No, maybe not yet. Am I happier? Definitely yes. Using programming to create art became a hobby that turned into a career. So now I do one-on-one -on -one online tutors on touch design and creative coding, planning to make a full course, full course next year. My works were displayed at exhibitions in New York, Moscow and Tokyo. My passion for trying new things is fulfilled. So thank you very much. Here are my contacts, website and Instagram. Thank you for your attention. Bye-bye. All right. Uh, my name is Dennis Ham. I'm a jazz piano player. I've been in Los Angeles for since 2004 um, and pretty much playing jazz um, my whole life. <laughs> well, until I, since I was a teenager. And um, I'm just going to dive in how I got started with uh, thinking about harmony visualization. Tell me if this is too loud too. It's okay. Is that good? Loud enough? It's definitely loud enough. It could be quieter. <laughs> okay. This is um this is what I've been doing the last 10 years with Thundercat.
So we're spending a lot of time improvising for larger and larger audiences over the years, including opening for the Red Hot Chili Peppers, which we're, we're on, in the middle of a tour right now for a four month worldwide tour. Um, I'm at, that's why I'm in a hotel room right now. <laughs> we had a performance last night at another stadium and um, yet we are, for these rock and roll audiences, we are still improvising in jazz harmony. Over, um, over the last probably nine years, we've been doing a lot of playing, a lot of uh, touring with Flying Lotus, who has an amazing visualization, um, the visual show with computer generated graphics. Um, looks a little like that. I don't know if that comes through on the screen. Yeah. Frame rate is low, but you can see it. Right, you can get the idea. Uh, Strange Loop and Time Boy are the. They're basically controlling the clips, um, the pre rendered clips for, for Flying Lotus. But I noticed that it was really um, emotionally impactful. It really enhanced the music a lot. And um, fast forward to 2021, when I discovered that Touch Designer allows you to create a similar aesthetic in live situations with live rendering um, and live generation of the animation. Um, here's Simon, who's also um, now a partner of mine for uh, in working on this project. Um, anyway, so this led to an idea that it's now possible to potentially marry live harmony with live animation. And that's not pre-composed music and not pre-rendered animation. So um, it, it was a, a light bulb moment of, wow, now we can possibly uh, represent some of the, some of the harmony that I'm that we're improvising live um, in in some new ways. So that led me to the question, what does harmony look like? Um, and I thought, well, it should probably look like how it feels. And um, but the question of how it feels is uh, not a simple question. <laughs> um, so that led me down a path of harmony perception research. Um, I spent the last year sitting at the piano. Can you hear this keyboard? Yeah. Um, playing chords, listening to how they make me feel, and even starting with just simple two note chords, which is what harmony is, is multiple notes at once, um, and examining my own perceptions. And then I ask fellow musicians about their perceptions. And then I read, I've read probably 350 uh, research papers now and theses. And, um, Turns out harmony perception is really, really complicated. So if you're going to try to visualize it um, and quantify it, uh, it's no easy task, um, which might be why it hasn't been done yet. <laughs> not, not that well. Um, so just for some of you that are maybe not musicians, um, some basic terms here, harmonies, multiple notes, chords are concurrently sounding notes. Here's a chord. I'm playing five notes there. Vertical harmony is isolated chords or stationary chords versus uh, horizontal harmony, which is chord progressions or melody or what you're typically used to listen to a song. Um, but I'm, I'm mostly concerned with uh, vertical harmony right now because um, that allows me to isolate each individual chord uh, and, and the emotions we feel with, with each chord. An interval is the distance between each note a second, a third, a fourth, a fifth, a sixth, seventh, eighth, which is an octave. <clears throat> they have also more precise names when you get into some of these intervals between all 12 notes. But again, the octave is the, uh, the exact same perceived pitch or same perceived note, an octave higher. So here's... Those are all A's on the piano. Um, also, the frequencies are doubled. 
So if, if this is 110, this is 220, this is 440, 880, 1760. Um, oops, go back. Um, okay, so vertical harmony is isolated chords, intervals, distances between notes. For every four notes, there are six intervals from C to E, C to G, C to B, E to G, E to B, and G to B. This is going to be important. Um, as I add more notes to chords, you see the number of intervals increases uh, a lot. Uh, so if I have a, even just a, there's a seven note chord, there's 21 intervals. And it turns out that each interval is really important or potentially important. So you have to, if you're gonna be quantifying harmony, you have to consider each of those intervals and what they might do to the meaning and the feeling of the sound. <clears throat> I love this quote from one of the one of the founders of calculus. Um, also, familiarity with intervals and and sounds within music uh, that we've heard throughout our entire lives influences emotion, influences emotions evoked by harmony. So it also makes it seem like this would be really challenging if it's so subjective. Um, and here's what Chick Corea has to say. Let me know if you can hear him. Uh, as far as music itself goes, yeah. um, you know, the simplest thing to forget is that what music is about and any kind of art form is about is, is creating the kind of things that, that you think are beautiful. In other words, when you sit as a piano player and, you, and you're creating, you have to learn to be certain about what you like, not what you think sounds good to someone else. Mm -hmm. you see, first thing is, is you have to learn your own heart and your own mind about about uh, sound. So whatever you think is beautiful, that's what's beautiful. See, and you have to pursue that road. Hell yeah! Uh, yeah, really, Miss Chick. He was uh, a gem, um, musically and personally. Um, so, yeah, if, if music is so subjective, um, one of the things that Chick taught me um, is that mistakes are opportunities to uh, change your perception. Um, when I was a kid playing music out, thanks to my parents and their patience, they would let me just bang away on the piano and I would play the same thing over and over and over again. And I would actually pay attention to how my feelings and my perceptions about it changed as I explored all the different ways around something. Um, so, but that kind of explains why, uh, why we have, why different people feel Different, differently about music they hear and why jazz harmony and improvisation might be strange for some audiences that are um, not as familiar with it. But what I'm going to go ahead and show Touch Designer now if I can get it running. Oh shoot, hope it's still looking up here. Um, let's see if this will work. Okay. Looking good. Great. Uh, that. Okay. So, what if harmony was a little more visually interesting and beautiful, even if it sounded strange? In fact, maybe even if the stranger that it sounds, the more interesting and beautiful it is. I think it's best if you play something slow so we can see the change. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, let's get back to... Uh... Okay. Uh, 
it's okay um okay that was a little teaser so uh <laughs> we have um it, it became important to to find the universal causes of uh, of harmony perception i want to find the things that are experienced by everyone um, then i can dive into showing maybe some of the the um, my own perceptions to audiences um, so it's important to note that uh, the nature's harmonic overtone series provides some harmony actually uh, in these this order of overtones of, of the octave and the fifth uh, and then the second octave and then a major third uh, is present in every acoustically produced tone so everything we're hearing produced by uh, a horn or a, a tube or a string or a vocal cords of human being um, has these overtones present. On a piano, it looks a little like this. There's a fundamental note that I play on the piano, but there's also other notes sounding, an octave up, a fifth above that, another octave. It's always the same order of overtones. Um, in the human voice, that helps us identify other humans, uh, the, the shape of their, of their, uh, you know, of their mouths, of their vocal cords, um, determines the volume of the overtones and the, the, the different volumes, even though they're in the same locations, um, frequency-wise, uh, in, in the relationship to the, to the, the lowest frequency um, that determines our brain starts learning basically that uh, octaves and fifths are supportive intervals and um, even from infancy subconsciously this is this is what's happening um, even if we don't analytically uh, understand it um, fifths are common in music of every culture every human culture even the tribes of uh, Papua New Guinea um, and uh, major thirds are common in, in Western music so major thirds for Westerners are kind of root supportive. Uh, let me explain what roots mean here in a second. <clears throat> so with the complications of, uh, of harmony perception, I'm looking to start with just a couple of uh, things here, or three things, um, chord root perception, dissonance, and uh, synesthesia. Uh, I'll go over those real quick. Um, the root of a chord is a, a pitch that the brain determines is the most important. And um, other feelings are grounded by them. Similar to, uh, to how multiple uh, pitches are being heard with the sound of a single note and the brain says the lowest note is most important we determine that the C in a C major 7 chord is most important and um, its relationship to the other notes is being considered predominantly <coughs> And even with that single root at the bottom, we can perceive multiple emotions at the same time. And I believe that those are coming from uh, the different interval relationships to the, to the root. But we can also have multiple roots. Um, and I'll talk about that in a second. Um, so perfect fifths provide the most root support. <coughs> the circle of fifths shows um, the relationship of fifths to um, all, the, all 12 notes on the piano. Um, if I play a C and a G together, you hear a C as a root. If I play an E and a B, you hear an E as a root. And an F and a C, F is the root. So that's, uh, they're clockwise. So counterclockwise, C and G, in the counterclockwise direction, the uh, the root is um, is the bottom of the counterclockwise uh, arrangement of notes. Um, 
Okay, so one of the exciting things I wanted to represent was multiple roots, um, which is not something that a lot of musicians think about. We have been trained to focus on chord symbols, um, where, we, where we pick the most uh, important root. Um, but I think subconsciously, from my last year of experimenting, um, that I think subconsciously our brain says there's multiple uh, roots to consider, and emotionally we're being affected by all of them that are that are competing for our attention. Um, David Huron is a um, researcher, and he talks about fame in the brain. Um, uh, I can get to that later. Uh, Simon. Is an amazing. He's with us today. He uh, is an amazing um, uh, touch designer artist, and I discovered him around the same time I discovered touch designer. And um, this is one of the posts that he uh, that he posted that made me think about um, representing multiple roots and and competition for a center position. So he helped. <laughs> apply after I wrote him uh, a message about my crazy ideas and he's he helped uh, turn a particle system that he had been working with into something and he can talk about this as well in the in the zoom breakout rooms um, uh, that represents attraction to the center and competition for the center position when you hear multiple roots Um, I'm going to fast forward through some of this stuff, but basically that's the sound of the ladder of fifths that George Russell talked about in the 40s, um, where the lowest pitch is B, that green. If I play in the opposite direction, the exact same notes. That's what that sounds like. Sorry, I'm playing the wrong notes there. D flat. You, you notice your ear probably hears that as not as clear a root. And that's what's represented visually as well. Versus that sound. Um, even with a low note, a low note that gives the impression that the low note is probably the root, the A in the chord, that yellow, still wins as the root because of the presence of fifths and uh, major thirds. Here's a diminished seven chord. Notice there's no center root. Each of these notes isn't supported by a fifth or a major third, so um, there's no competition for the center position. Also, this visualization project is, is uh, representing turbulence, which is uh, what we hear with small intervals. Um, there's sensory and psychological dissonance. Um, sensory Hear that? That's the sound of a minor second. Um, sensory dissonance is a physiological thing uh, where our, our physical ear has problems differentiating two different notes when they're that close together. Um, psychological dissonance is um, based on our perception of the root. So both of these things I'm kind of... Uh, estimating both of these factors um, with my dissonance visualization. So here's uh, um, here's that <clears throat> here's that uh, spaced out stacked fifths chord and then the exact same notes played all together creates dissonance because of the presence of those seconds. But also note there's slight dissonance during this chord because each of those notes that are being played has the 
overtones present as well at lower volumes than what I'm playing these fundamental notes. But the, so if I play a B, there's another green note up higher, um, several of them, and those are closer, and some of them are gonna be seconds with the other notes that I'm playing. And so there's slight distance there because of the lower volumes of the overtones. Synesthesia, um, I, I was treating the colors like a, um, just a way to uh, represent pitch relationships, but turns out 4% of people in the world have synesthesia where they actually see specific colors with, uh, with pitches. And, or, and sometimes it's not pitches, sometimes it's collections of pitches, sometimes it's, they see shapes instead. Um, there's all types of different kinds of synesthesia, but, um, and most of these uh, synesthetes don't have the same color relationships um, to, to pitches. So um, I've been talking to a lot of musicians and many of them have told me their colors that they see and they've sent me their colors and I've applied them to my visualizer here and uh, one guy in particular, Taylor Eichsty, um, he said he watched it with the sound on mute and he could tell all the harmony um, without hearing it. That was fascinating. I've set up a website um, to talk about some of my hypotheses that support this project. Um, many of them were developed after uh, ex experimenting on the piano and listening to my own feelings. <laughs> um, so you can go there and read a little more about some of these things. Um, I'll demonstrate some more chords for you, but all these different chord types have a single singular root, but multiple different types of compound multidimensional feelings. Uh, blah, blah, blah. You can, you can get into this uh, on the website if you want. I also have been petitioning um, Instagram followers for their feelings about chords and, and things. And here's hundreds of emotional responses to some sounds, um, some chords. Um, so, because ultimately I want to be able to, to change the um, constants in my, in the visualizer to, to be tailored to um, the artist, or the musician who's using it, or to specific audience members. <clears throat> What I'm most excited about is collaborating with animators who have their own perceptions about how visuals um, are emotionally impactful for them. And so I want to provide some emotional effect categories, data for those emotional effects to, in real time to animators so that we can be collaborating on live improvisational works. Um, that's a really exciting thing for me um, to think about in the future. I'm gonna go ahead and just, uh, I think we're running out of time here, so, but um, I'm gonna provide a link in the chat with a, a way to, to view, I haven't actually published this stuff yet, so it's, it's gonna be a, a link for you to see um, what this visualizer does without the latency of the, uh, and the, and the frame, rate, frame rate drop of this stream. So thank you very much. Right, so as you know, my name is William. And uh, I'm going to give you a bit of, uh, yeah, some some background of my project before I actually give a slight overview, uh, like 20 minutes overview of what we're doing here or what we can do with this. So um, mainly uh, what my idea behind this is, is to create a, a tool or framework, a, yeah, like a, a software inside of Touch Designer that enables the users, uh, which I'm, so far is just me, but I will very likely share this on Patreon soon. And so it will, uh, yeah, it enables the user to to basically create audiovisual live performances. And the idea is really to have a kind of VJ system, but not with videos or not just with videos, but rather with generative art. So tox files and uh, visual patches that you can manipulate live. So I have actually like some time ago before I got into touch design, I was working with Resolume and that was a lot of fun, but for me, it wasn't really, it didn't feel enough to just uh, put effects on it. I know they have wire now, but 
it still it wasn't uh, enough for me to just play videos uh, especially of other people and then just apply effects on it i want to actually manipulate and change the visuals live and i want them to be generated live so that's what the software is really about and just as a quick background i uh, the original version so this is the fourth version i've actually started from scratch four times <laughs> So I learned so much with every version and uh, also touch designer and myself, we just uh, both uh, grew. So um, there there were a lot of changes I always wanted to make and uh, it's also just a lot of fun to me. So yeah, this is the fourth version. The, the first one was actually a part of my bachelor thesis. Uh, so like two years ago, I, I finished university and this is this was like my my final project for that, the first version. That this, there's also a video on YouTube about that. Um, yeah, it has changed quite a lot since then. And the last two or so months, basically ever since the latest release of the of Switch Designer, of the 2022 version, I have been working on this very intensely. And I'm going to show you a bit around now. So I hope the frame rate isn't too shitty, but I will record a video on YouTube of, uh, of this anyways. Uh, so like a full overview. This is very much still a work in progress and um, it's not finished. There's still a few bugs. Um, generally, I'm very open for like new suggestions and features. So <clears throat> the uh, basic idea here is um, we have this user interface. I, uh, I built from scratch too. And the basic idea here is that we have a sort of system that goes from left to right. So we have our audio input on the left and uh, audio device like input devices. I will I will show you in a, in a minute. And then we have our visuals. So we have two sets of visuals that we can uh, update. So I can uh, load in any kind of visual here from my list. So I can define a folder here and then it will automatically look for talks files that I can then load in here and sort of play so I can switch between them. And um, let me just get this over here. I can uh, fade between them like this. I can uh, composite visuals and uh, I can also, yeah, I'm gonna go into this in more detail in a minute. And um, then on the right, we have the output. So I can output to a projector here or I can uh, change my, like I can add post effects here. I will also show that. So really it's like you have inputs, you can, with which you can manipulate visuals. You have two sets of visuals that you can always fade between. And um, then you have some post effects. So I'm gonna go into the visuals first, just to a bit more. So as I said, you have this list here and this isn't just any kind of list you, you can pick from. You can also use this as a playlist. So I can like click on, uh, on, this, on this playlist button and it's just gonna pick the next one here in my list and automatically fades to that. So um, I'm not sure how well you can see all of this, but. That's really the idea. So before a show, you could make your playlist with the talks files that you want to use uh, in the correct order. You can reorder them here. And then you can just click on, on next, basically, and it's just going to load your next visual. And then for every visual, uh, you have custom parameters if you have set them up before. And uh, it's going to automatically load them in here. So far, uh, it um, supports uh, floats. Uh, integers and like uh, toggles and poses. I don't really see a reason to use much more right now because I don't I don't really use any other parameters for these visuals myself. But yeah, you can see them being uh, created in, in this way here. So if I just uh, like this, you can see it just makes these yeah styled uh, parameters. And I will go into more detail that in a second, but I can just use them like manually like this. Let me see that better with this. And I also have presets I can um, switch between. So I can save all of my parameters and then just uh, switch between them um, either like by clicking on here or by clicking on here, which I will show you why that's important. So I can go for different presets here, same here. And yeah. So that, that's basically the, the talk setup. Um, I, what I also have down here is a menu where I can click on media. And if I switch to media, then it immediately switches the output to a video, in, like a video that I have or an image that I have set up here. So I can click on this button. I can 
load in any video. So it's really like, if you use it like that, it's pretty much a VJ system. And then you can like, for example, there's two different modes here that, so you can like trigger between um, different parts of the video, or you can like just go through it like this. Um, don't really need to go into detail. You might not even be able to see as well, but there's basically different modes and there's probably gonna be more of uh, playing this video and then manipulating the video, which I'll talk about. Now, uh, there's also the camera and like in, in camera input and external input so you can route and route in NDI or spout or siphon. So uh, you could just use algorithm for the post effects or something. So if I go back to talks uh, and just uh, talk about the inputs, I can show you uh, the, the parameters here a bit more. So we have a, a file or device in, just as Touch Designer has. So we can click on this icon here and it will open up the Touch Designer uh, controls. And I can uh, yeah, play a file here. I'm not sure if you're gonna hear that. Can you hear that? No, it doesn't, doesn't really matter. Um, it's the, it's the uh, typical <laughs> standard. Um, touch designer song. So we either use a file, but if we want to play live, obviously what we're going to use is a device. And then we can switch here. And then I have this uh, loader down here where I can load in my input devices. So I can click on audio and it's going to show me a selection of audio devices that I can use. For example, kick detection. So if I click on kick detection, it's going to load that device in here and it's going to automatically pick up my signal from uh, from the file. So now you can see, uh, not, I don't have audio on now, like, but it doesn't really matter. So basically I'm, I'm, there's different, like there's a range here of a spectrum and um, I can change this handle to, um, I can also show that with the kick to um, wherever the kick hits most prominently. And then I can adapt these parameters to really perfectly filter out my kick. And then I always have my um, my outputs here. And these outputs I can use to really manipulate any parameter. And that is the, the very core idea I've had from beginning on with algorithm is that, you know, it's kind of the idea of touch designer too, but you have all these input channels and with these, you can manipulate the software. And this time, not only the software, not only the parameters, but also the, um, the software itself. So I'm gonna talk about that in a second. I'm just gonna drag my kick onto here. And I'm going to add some smoothing. I'm not sure again with the SPF, FPS how well you can see this, but now my period of my noise is controlled by this kick, and I can do the same with something else like my snare here, um, and really anything. So I can do that here. I can also do the same thing here. And if I save presets, the the connections uh, between here, like that I have set here are gonna be saved too, actually. If I save a preset, it's also gonna remember the connection that I have set here to, to my devices. So kick and snare are one example, and I'm gonna build many, many more audio devices, like input devices here. One other thing is beat, and I think, uh, yeah, it's a pretty interesting one. We have two different beat uh, devices so far. One is rhythms, which is really just based on this clock down here. So what we can do, we can either tap tempo or um, just manually type in the tempo here to have it be the same as whatever track is being played. And then we can see our bar here. We can reset this here to the one, and you can see that resets the beat as well. So we have our uh, eighth, fourth uh, house. I still don't know how to properly name them. Um, and like uh, the holes, and we can use these as well to again, control the visuals. So it's really much like a lot of this is based on, on rhythm. And we ha also have a sequencer I just recently built where we, uh, which is also based on the clock here where we can basically add a pattern which will be output here. And that pattern again, we can use to manipulate any parameter. I'm gonna smooth this a bit. Okay, there, there, there's still some bugs, <laughs> but yeah, basically that's, that's the idea here. You have all of these devices uh, you can you can sort them, you can delete them, you can uh, fold them so they take away less power. 
And um, that's really like one of the main ideas here that I had. In the previous version, I had all of this, the audio analysis and all this stuff happening at the same time. And um, now you can select whatever you need in that moment, and then it's going to actually be much better frame rate. It's, it's not great right now because I'm streaming. But technically, without anything in here, this is actually running for around 100 FPS. And um, if I do have a lot of stuff in here, it goes down to 60. And especially if you project this to another screen, with the, you can click on here, and it's going to output that to, to another monitor. And it's going to automatically be on 60 because of the refresh rate, I think. All right, so that's the uh, inputs here. There's going to be more. There's, for example, MIDI. Um, and I'm going to, like, it doesn't work in the new, latest release for some reason for me. But uh, just to show you quickly, um, what I meant with you can't only control these parameters. There is, for example, this button here that um, controls the fade from one visual to the other. And I can use my kick and put that on there. And that's going to actually, like, it doesn't, work perfectly with the kick, but technically this could be a media input and then you can like pretty much like enabled and you can control any button here for example also this one and um, yeah there's a bug that it doesn't work right now but technically you can use this button and be controlled by the kick so you can create up to 16 presets here and then you can use your that's what it's set to random right now um you can switch between all your presets which i think can create really really interesting outputs and yeah talking about outputs as i said you can send these here to projectors and uh, you can also send them out via ndi or spout you can set the resolution everything and then you also have the same system as here on the left you have i haven't built that many yet but there's going to be a lot more for example i can add a kaleidoscope and that's just going to be applied as a post effect and now i can manipulate this kaleidoscope and again, I could control this with uh, my kick. So you can already see, I'm not sure again, <laughs> the FPS, but technically this is being nicely controlled now by, by the kick. And um, I can also turn these on and off like this, and I can add a transform. And um, it, now, like if I turn on both, you can also resort these. Um, like if I, for example, scale this down, change my tiling, it's going to make a difference, the order of post effects, right? If I have a tr transform first or a kaleidoscope first. So I can also order my post effects here, which really makes, again, for like a lot of different interesting combination, especially if you then uh, make them react to audio. Uh, yeah, so I think that's really the, the main, all the main things. There's, there's some smaller features I'm not going to go into now. But so really just to recap here, the idea is you have, you make your own visuals or you use mine or you use visuals of anyone. Um, by the way, also presets are being saved inside of Toxis. And then you can, for example, let's say you have a show in the evening where you wanna, wanna perform visuals and it's, it's a specific genre, then maybe you can have a folder with visuals that you use for the genre. And then you can uh, just prepare like that and play these here live or also use um, videos that fit to, to this theme. Um, and then you can yeah make them react to audio very easily and with the MIDI in, which is uh, gonna be or like OC in or anything, you can you can control all of that. You don't even need to uh, use your mouse or keyboard or anything. So yeah, and uh, there's there's obviously a few things I, I'm still working on and there's still quite a few bugs. But technically, this is running much, much better than all the versions before. As I said, like without anything in here, it's running with 100 FPS, which I think is pretty, pretty sweet. And uh, it's also been, yeah, I haven't actually, that's, that's not using any widgets at all. It's all UI elements are basically built from scratch. And um, meaning they're, they're all based on the text comp of the new release. So they're pretty efficient, I would, I would say. And um, yeah, there's a, a lot more devices I'm going to build on like both input and output devices. And uh, for example, there's features like recording is something that I want to add, which I'm not sure how to perfectly do yet. But um, so and also connect us to Ableton and all these kind of things. So there's there's many, many things I want to do here. And as I said, I'm going to probably do like, yeah, my idea is to 
um, share this with uh, with patrons for now, uh, so they can test it. And if I have more stable version without uh, or with less bugs, <laughs> then um, then I'm probably gonna share it. I'm not sure how to do that perfectly, but yeah, pretty much. I, I want this to be sort of a easy to use tool for everyone who wants to create visuals and doesn't need to even dive into touch designer too deeply. Obviously this is only running in touch designer, not as a standalone. But... <laughs>